Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast. Here with Benji, as always, for the first ever recap of the Paris Bay Femme race on this Saturday. This show is supported by our show partner, Lacole. Speaking of women's cycling and Lacole, Joss Loudon of Drops Lacole, you saw at the World Champs, broke the women's hour record officially on Thursday and that live streams on Lacole's YouTube channel, wearing the McLaren Project Aero skin suit in that record proving how quick that bit of kit is you can check out lacole through the link in the description at www.lacole.cc thanks to them for supporting the podcast parkour 117 kilometers long the first cobbled sector after horanang with about 34 k's done and 80 k's to go and yeah we had a pretty strong start list here as well we were missing a couple of cyclocrosses though Vass and brand who i believe were trying to they need super prestige points or something that i don't understand that <laughs> sport but benji live coverage unfortunately only started with about 50 k's to go we'll talk about some of the background the business behind the race etc the coverage at the end we'll talk the race and tactics first 50 k's to go, we see Diagon and Clear. We'd seen it and heard it on Twitter first. What did you see from both the race situation and the state of the course? Yes, at that point, we were on uh, Mozon Pavel, basically, which is the first five-star sector that women have to ride over of the two. Carford Larbor is the la- latest one that is in the uh, last 17 kilometers. But yeah, 50k to go, Mozon Pavel, Diagon is at the front solo. And uh, yeah, the parkour is uh, somewhat wet at that point. But I feel like Mozan Pavel wasn't the uh, extremist of sectors looking at the mud and so forth on the parkour. But we had some sections on that cobble sector that did cause some uh, some crashes and uh, some odd crashes as well. But yeah, she had a lead and it was a pretty large lead. One minute 55 plus almost at that moment. And um, quite clever that she decided to ride away on the first Cobble sector is one of the scenarios that we mentioned on the preview that somebody would like to do this. And it's logical when you think about it, because if you're a rider that is Diagnon, you've got a leader, perhaps co-leader, Alan Van Dijk, Longo Borghini, those two riders in this race. So you have one rider that could go very early. And if you decide to go on the first cobble sector and you put that rider ahead and remove them from a potential group crash, because group crashes were bound to happen in this race. So if you were able to put at least one rider up front and make that move that early, then you have a benefit over other people. And yeah, we saw very swiftly also before the broadcast started that crashes were happening in the group behind and that causes the chase to have trouble trying to close down a gap. And the more and more people crash, the less and less people you have to try and catch uh, the rider up front, Lizzie Dignan. And uh, a pretty ballsy move, to be honest, but I think it's because the team had multiple candidates for this race that they dare to go for a strategy like this. Do you think that others missed out by not following? For sure. That's what I thought. Remember, we, I was like, I thought there was going to be a group, Benji, of Majerus or Peters plus an Anna Henderson plus a Leah Thomas plus someone from FTJ. I thought there was going to be that sort of group, not a solo rider. Now, I think there might have been a group, a smaller group that Diagnon attacked out of. But yeah, on her team, we've got European champ Van Dyke, who is incredibly strong there. Cordon Rigaud, French rider, experienced as well. Elisa Longoborghini, one of the most versatile and probably this consistently their strongest rider throughout the season. Yeah. I Diagnon, not the, not the favorite on that team at all. Uh, as particularly, she's won Tour of Flanders in 2016, but her form this year has not been top level. She has not been the level of Ludwig Nuvidoma, Voss, Vollering, Van der Breggen, Van Vleuten. She's not been that level uh, this year. She's been getting a bit better in some other races. But, yeah, clearly put her out in front. Great tactical move. Uh, who was already out of contention, Benji? We saw Gepecki puncture Van Vleuten before coverage even started. Crash, dropped, or had a mechanical? Do you know the confirmed report? So, first of all, we have a, a report of Sporza that said halfway to raise that Roizer actually already crashed even before the first cobble sector, apparently, and right. uh, had to abandon the race, which is really unfortunate. Um, next to that, we had that crash by Kopecky, but that was a weird one because she was on the left side of the of the cobble sector. I think it was on Mozart Pavel, actually. And she had a back wheel puncture, she looked at the right, and there seemed to be a rider from her team on the right side of the road. 
and I think she wanted to change bikes or something, or she lost control. I can't really tell from the very far away camera view that we had, and therefore she just went across the road and she crashed so crashed somebody else as a consequence. And I don't know if it was because she wanted to go there to change the bike with that other uh, teammate or because she lost control going to the right of the road, but she was unable to stop by the side of the road and she basically went into the ditch at that same exact moment. So there has to be some loss of control there, I'm guessing. But uh, yeah, that shows how swiftly something can change if you're riding in a groove because you can just be riding there and then there's a rider on the left side of the road who has a puncture and as a consequence, you're crashing. So your race can be over so swiftly and the likes of that stuff happened to Yolindor as well in this race. I know because sports I kept talking about where is Yolindor for the entirety of this broadcast. So I basically heard nothing but that commentary today. <laughs> and um I think next to that, just plenty of stuff. I think Van Vleuten was one of the ones to drop on the first cobble section early on, but it could have been through a puncture. I don't know. Then we had a crash, including Ellen Van Dijk, also on uh, Mozan Pavel. She wasn't on the floor, if I recall correctly, but she was pretty far behind in the group and had to start coming back. And if Mozan Pavel is where the group behind also starts opening up, because that's what was happening. Christine Majerus was one of the stronger riders in this race, in my eyes, when it comes to uh, the ease at which she went over cobbles during the race itself, Mozan Pavel and so forth, she was the one who was uh, actually making a move at the front of the group and was, I think, a four-women group, including Mariana Voss already, and two other candidates that I uh, don't know by heart at the top of my head. I think it was Longo Borghini and another one. And um, yeah, that group had a tiny bit of a gap on the others from that peloton or what was left of the peloton because we have 30 people going into uh Mozan Pavel as the peloton and uh I think that Van Dijk was quite a bit behind that because there were the likes of like multiple domestiques from Jumbo still in between those groups between Van Dijk and the group of Majerus we also had uh uh another teammate from Trek Cordonago was also uh relatively close towards the front of that group and uh yeah Mozan Pavel basically exploded the race in uh in the peloton and it's it's sad that we didn't get the coverage five minutes earlier because if we had it five minutes earlier then we would have seen more than pavel and phil <laughs> and that would have been much better <laughs> yeah uh, i know yeah it's and there was a tailwind today so it was not even the 60 k's we'd expect it but yeah the groups or groups very all across the road after that cobbled section eventually they came together and i thought we might have a, a full-on chase of Lizzie Diagnan, who had about a two-minute advantage. A large group did form a G2 with teams with multiple teammates. Jumbo Visma had Voss, Bekus, Marcus, Kasper, SD Works had Vandenbroek, Lark, Majerus, Peters, Movistar, Norsgaard, Bjarnic, Thomas. Trek had three riders to block. And then we had Roy Bastianelli, Martins, and Brenauer. I would add to Benji's shout-out to Majerus that I thought Brenauer was – she was pulling a lot of the cobble, cobbled sections – I think uh, Monson Pavel as well. Brenauer did look good yeah. on the cobbles, which I expected, but uh, and she'd get a decent result here too. She just didn't have any teammates to do the work for her. And I'm just surprised now here, Benji, with 34 Ks to go, that, yeah, SD Works at three, Movistar three, and Jumbo Visma three domestiques. They couldn't make any impression on Lizzie Diagnan. Um, I just, yeah, I just guess the cobbles kept splitting it apart. And there was still, you know, with that 9, 12 Ks of cobbles in that 30, 34 Ks left to the finish. And it just seemed that drafting was almost, uh, drafting was almost the worst thing you wanted. You just meant you were going to crash more and were more <laughs> likely to crash. And yeah. being at the front of the group was the safest. So that group eventually split apart. When did we start to see riders just making solo moves? Well, just beforehand, I do want to talk a bit more about the dynamics in that chasing group, because like you said, Yumbo was there, Movi starting for Fulf, but it felt like um, the riders that were supposed to do the work to make that chase happen were also just the riders that just came back after Mozan Pavel. So they're clearly not in a great shape when they just dropped on Mozan Pavel compared to the riders they were... Uh, while well, getting back to. And that was pretty clear because it was, for example, I think Tönche Bekais was one of the riders well, for Jumbo that was uh, dropped and then came back and directly went to the front of the group to start hammering it. But if one rider is doing it, then it's not going to be working. So Jumbo put a few more riders up there and started chasing. But Movistar wasn't directly helping out that swiftly. It wasn't until one of the coming cobble sections where 
we did see a proper move by Movistar to try and get get back to the front. And that's where trouble started arising because, well, they were chasing quite well. But you know that when, like you said, you're riding in draft, it's likely if one goes down that multiple riders go down. And there was an extra crash that followed as a consequence where I think Van Dijk ended up going down. I think Nordsgaard was also one of the riders going down. And um, I, I don't know 100% every single ride that went down today because it was basically 90% of the peloton. But I, um, we just had that crash. And from that point onwards, you know that the riders that are left are the ones that are going to have to do the solo chasing. And it's near Carrefour de Larbre already that we have to start seeing uh, solo moves. It was at the sector just before Carrefour de Larbre, if I recall correctly, that um, we saw proper uh, selection in that chasing group. And, well, if, for example, the Yumbo riders are now dropping again, the Movistar riders have Norsgaard who crashed, and we've got Von Dijk dropping, won't have an influence on the chase, really, because it's her teammate at the front. But all that plays into the cards of Dijknen, because you've got less people that can chase down, and those less people can't wait on those other people again. They have to start going solo. And that's where uh, we saw Mariana Voss taking a couple section on like crazy, right? Yeah, Voss is crazy. Like, I thought she wouldn't be the best on the cobbles. I mean, I thought she'd be like top five maybe, but I like Brenner. Yeah, she had that look in her eyes that I thought this is the only way she can chase anyone down. And it, what Benji said about the domestiques, they're almost like an illusion. It reminds me of, you know, when Matthews had Mezgets, you know, there to close the gap for him in the Vuelta in that final sprint. But uh, when they caught Vine and then there was another stage, but it's, it's an illusion. The guys cook from having to work. If you rely on them, the gap's just going to keep going out and Diagnon. It also relies on Diagnon being incredibly strong as well. But to be honest, Benji, it came down to a minute 20, a minute 15. I never, It was never in doubt for Diagnon. Unless she crashed, there was an awesome clip where she yeah. fishtailed. Um, she got her bike, started to go the yeah. left wheel, started to go left a little bit. She overcorrected with, well, I'm not really overcorrected. She let the bike do what it needed to do, as Magnus Backstep would say and like completely fished out, kept it upright. And yeah, the only way she was losing is if she had a bad mechanical or crashed, neither of which happened. We also saw Elisa Longo Borghini chasing Mariana Voss from the group behind, which I think had Bernal and Bastianelli split apart completely, Balsamo and co. They're still finishing credit to them. Everyone's still continuing the course. But yeah, Lizzie Dagen and Benji, did you see, like, do, do you think... She actually was superior in terms of technical ability on the cobbles um, because she seemed to – everyone's slipping around constantly, but she seemed to just be comfortable with that environment of allowing the bike to move around and not you know, grabbing brake or trying to force the bike where it didn't need to go. Yeah, firstly, you've got the advantage that you're riding solo, so you can choose every single line yourself on the cobble sections. It's not like you have to try and evade other people that are in front of you. It's not like other people can crash you when you're riding solo, so that's one advantage. But next to that, she also was just one of the best riders on the course today. Otherwise, you don't do that. Otherwise, you don't... Uh, Otherwise, you weren't unable to keep that gap so long compared to Yumbo riders chasing. Then again, those Yumbo riders had dropped on a cobble section already, but still... Dagnan has also been on the attack for quite a bit before that happened. So it's not like she was uh, having the easiest time before uh, Mozan Pavel even started. And as a consequence, all these details coming together, her technique being relatively good today, for quite, quite clearly, with uh, the save she made on that thing you just mentioned, the almost crash she had, the uh, fact that she was certainly good on cobbles. I think last week on, on Flanders... Uh, we mentioned that on the, uh, was it Bekstraat, where she was one of the uh, stronger riders in the peloton in the uh, Flandria circuit. And uh, perhaps we should have seen that as an indicator that the cobble sections are perhaps what she is very good at. And the fact that she's unable to follow on again to Abelgem and so forth at certain points was because of the hills, most likely. And perhaps she that's the division though. between a Paris or Bay. Yeah, but not. Not this year. Not recently. True. Do you think, I'm trying to think of comparable races, but then at World Championships, 
I, I would have thought, I guess they, they did a slow race and she then favoured like the sprinters like Voss and Balsama. I don't, yeah, it's it's interesting to see you how Diagon's career has gone, I guess, to go from, uh, you know, I think a third-tier classic rider to then an 80K solo today is, is a big, big change and improvement in performance. But she obviously uh, was strong back in, you know, she'd been winning 2016, 17, 18, and I think, of course, in 2019. But she wins this race clear, going solo into the velodrome. She had time to celebrate, but she didn't really. She rode it hard to the line, winning a minute and 17 ahead of Mariana Voss, second again, just like it was. A shame for Voss. Third, Longo Bordaghini, a minute 47, a Trek duo on the podium. Brenau are four seconds behind uh, Longo Borghini in fourth, my pick for the race. Bastianelli fifth, Nors- winning the sprint against Norsgaard, Francisco Koch and Cordon Rigaud, Cavalli, Vandenbroek Black rounding out the top ten. Shout out to uh, Marjolin Landkluf on Drops the Coal and Maria Martins, both in the top 20 uh, for Drops the Coal. It's a really good result for those riders. And we mentioned, I think Benji mentioned Landkluf in the previous one to watch but yeah an impressive performance from Diagon and Benji any other performances you like to point out as someone you think overperformed underperformed I feel like the weather underperformed compared to the uh, expectations of it but I'm kind of glad that it did knowing how many people crashed today as well without the weather being as extreme as uh, people had uh, been saying there was no like very active rain on the course while the riders were riding which is a good thing um nonetheless there were rough patches in there and that was that section where Dinan had to correct herself to uh prevent crashing but all in all i feel like um we saw today that this race is still also decided by the luck factor i'm not saying that Dinan is super lucky today for winning this race 100 percent not what a wonderful performance but the chase yeah half of the people crashing in the chase that obviously doesn't help a chase group you know and that's a factor in Roubaix and it's proven once again and that's uh on one end kind of the beauty of Roubaix but I uh I, I don't like crashes so that's uh the unfortunate aspect of that so I don't hope for uh, injuries on any of the riders I hope that they come out of this without too many injuries because uh I fear that we will have quite a few after the crashes we saw today yeah that's the thing it's everyone loves Roubaix but then I was looking at it today and I was like if someone tried to start this race today, as in like the cold concept of Paris Bay, it would be like outlawed as not a safe race because <laughs> yeah. it's not it's not safe. Like, yeah, people people literally can't ride this course. Even re- a guy broke his Reza Big broke his pelvis doing the recon yesterday. Like, it's literally not safe. But as we know, extreme weather protocol and safety only applies to stage races in Italy. Um, <laughs> but anyway, let's talk about. Uh, we, we were going to have the women's tour coming out. Let's talk about the live coverage for this race, Benji. There's been, I admit, now obviously I have a business relationship with ASO in terms of you know the license agreement for my main channel. That being said, this is my opinion that they have received uh, an inordinate amount of unfair criticism regarding putting on the first ever edition of this race. This is the first ever edition of this race, despite the men's. You know, the men's race is a separate race. They have no data on viewership. They have no, you know, who knows how much money they're bringing in for sponsorship, et cetera, for this race. Obviously, for Tour de France, Femme to get off the ground, they have to have it co-titled by Zwift next year. There's no Paris-Roubaix Femme by Zwift or whoever. So they haven't been able to get the money in that way, one would assume. They were projected to have 60 kilometres of coverage, which is more than most women's World Tour races. We indeed saw the women's World Tour not able to have any live coverage this year, which World Women's World Tour races are required to have, and people were quite kind to them and understanding about the commercial realities of that during the week. Now, we then have an, a lot of focus on the, the prize money issue with Paris Bay Femme. And my question when people put, bring this up, NG, often people working for quite large companies in the media space is, the cycling business model is organizer puts on race, organizer makes money from sponsors and broadcasters. And if there's not equal prize money, if there's not full coverage, that's because sponsors and or broadcasters have not stepped up. Those companies put their hand up and said, we want to invest in that. Or conversely, we see ROI in that and we'll put our money there and invest in it. 
I am sure if a company had come to ASO in advance of Paris Bay Femme and said, we'll top up the women's prize pool to 100. Did anyone do that? I'm so, I would be surprised if ASO said, no, we're going to keep it low, actually. Thanks for your offer to sponsor the prize pool. We'll keep it low. Did any company <laughs> go to ASO and say, I will pay for full coverage if France TV or any other broadcaster go and say, I'll pay for full exclusive coverage before the, first, the last 60Ks? And did ASO say no? I would say that's pretty surprising if they did. Uh, so I'm not sure why ASO is expected, and there is, you know, it's reasonable to make an expectation. They make the investment in this race and build up its profile at a loss. And other parties involved in cycling are like, yeah, we'll take the broadcast for cheap, uh, probably. We'll put it on, etc. But yeah, we'll also, you know, they're not going to invest, not expected to invest the money. I just don't know why. It seems to be a failure to understand the business model, Benji. But what's the bigger problem for you? You've been talking about it on Twitter. To me, the coverage is the bigger issue than the prize money right now. I agree. Now, to give you a, an accurate number before we go into the discussion of this, I do want to say that the uh, prize money difference is quite significant. So for the women, we have a total prize pot of 7,005 euros. For the men, we have 91,000. Before I get into my idea of it all, I've got a mixed opinion on this. First of all, I feel like, yes, this is imbalance is uh, too large and it should be very much smaller. Secondly, I believe that there are people that are seeing investing in prize money as a quick win. And I don't see it as a good quick win in that aspect, because you got to look at this and say, coverage is an investment, prize money is an investment. What do you do when you invest in the prize money of this race yesterday? What if you invest in it, for, in it, for example? Well, then you have more prize money today. Okay, that's it. There's no like follow-up for next year. Sure, you have a, a better standard or like a, a set bar for next year that you're going to try and get better than uh, this year when it comes to prize money. But the other side of the coin is I'd rather have these companies or these other organizers invest in the coverage because coverage has a lasting effect. Investing in coverage causes interest to happen from sponsors and viewers, which has an influence on the future investments in the sport, which has an influence on the salary of these riders on the for road. For all riders. For all riders, like you say. Next to that, this also adds to the future prize money consistently. Because if you're able to build this up, like gradually by investing in coverage, you will automatically have a return when it comes to prize money in the future. That's how I see the economy of the sport and of women cycling myself. Investing less in coverage and deciding to spend that money into uh, direct prize money, well, you first of all will have many less people uh, watching, you will have less sponsorship interests, you will have less future consequences of this broadcast happening, and riders agree with that. We have on Vleuten, who is completely on board with the idea that prize money is not as important as, uh, as coverage, but... I do want to rem remind that I do think that the difference between the two is significant. And I don't have a valid answer personally to the question, well, why don't they just split the men's money in half and up it a bit for the women? Because for the men, it's, it's for the staff. Yes, just like in the women's peloton, mainly that teams give their prize money to staff members in the team and so forth for their uh, uh, work for the team and stuff like that. Yeah. and. I feel like we will only have uh, that happening when a men's rider steps up and says, okay, well, this is kind of... Well, okay. no. What about... There's, a, there's this regulatory body called the UCI. The UCI yeah. mandated minimums, they conveniently have extremely low for their world championships. Uh, and so, yeah, ASO have made them in compliance with the UCI mandated minimums. This would not be acceptable in 2025 when hopefully we have four years of data on Paribas FM when we have broadcasters hopefully paying more money for the broadcast rights, sponsors paying more, then 2024, 2025, this is a process. It will not be acceptable to not have parity of prize money then. But we are not there yet. This is the first edition of the race, and I feel for this is the same thing that happened to Vanden Spiegel, yep. CEO of Flanders Classics before Omloop, one of the best race organisers for trying to build up women's cycling and, as we said in the preview, putting the brand of these famous races onto the women's cycling, the same names, so that there's name recognition helps a lot. And he was criticised for, and he said, listen, we've put over, we've put six figures 
into live broadcast for these new races. That was the toss up we had to do, and we chose six figures into live broadcast. And yeah, I think ASO probably needs to, yeah, maybe bring out some messaging if they want to themselves. But yeah, it's uh, hopefully next year, Benji, we well, have more. I'd, I'd like to see more mm-hmm. coverage next year because I, I was, I got to say, disappointed with the rate. Like watching the winning move already happen before live coverage starts, that sucks. And I think, yeah, I just, it really lessens. Like what my analysis video on my main channel, like what's there for me to analyze now, you know? Yeah, uh, I do want to uh, add on to the discussion here one thing that also happened this week, and that's uh, the fact that the women's store will not have, be having a live broadcast after announcing in, uh, was it February or March, that they uh, had a deal with GCN to have it live broadcasted uh, on uh, on GCN Plus and so forth. And that is not happening in the women's store. And I feel like Arzur Bay, Omlop, Tirosa last year had so much more criticism than this organizer has. And I'm not saying that they should be scrutinized for not being able to pay for uh, live broadcasting, but there should be an influence to that. If you, for example, last year, you look at Giro Rosa, they don't have live broadcasts. Well, they are being sent to the uh, women's world, outside of the women's world tour category. So they're being demoted when it comes to their race classification, Giro Rosa. And with this race, we haven't heard any of that because we know that the UCI makes decisions based on pressure outside of a uh, well factual data so media pressure public pressure and so forth and without that pressure of people talking up against races that don't have a live broadcast and so forth well you won't have that same influence you won't have for example that they demote the women's tour now to a non women's world tour race and personally i'm of the opinion that just dropping them outside of women's world tour isn't a solution either so it's not like I want these organizers to be criticized because it's not easy to organize a, the broadcast of a race like this. You First of all, it's, it's quite expensive. You can broadcast it two ways. You either need a plane or with 4G. If you're in a region that does not have 4G, you have to get a plane or multiple planes to get a broadcast set up. And I'm no genius when it comes to like how the technicalities and so forth happen, but I know that planes are expensive to rent and uh, I've never tried it because I can't afford it. Uh, next to that, like, where does an organizer get the money for that? It's sponsorships and selling the license of the broadcast to uh, to uh, channels that are broadcasting it, like you mentioned. So once again, a broadcaster not willing to pay is likely the consequence, or not willing to pay as much as needed to broadcast the race is likely a consequence of the women's tour not being able to provide a live broadcast in my eyes. But they are providing hi- highlights, which is probably because they're saving the camera footage on the motorbike to then edit it after the race i'm expecting or yes. something like yeah, that they're saving it locally so yeah it's it's definitely not easy to set up live broadcasts and so forth but then this race is getting less like bashing because it's generally bashing that paris Bay has gotten over the last few days based on that prize money uh issue while this is a bigger issue for the future of women's cycling and yeah, I just see the – it's kind of hypocrisy at this point. Well, I mean, if you're – the existence of Roubaix and Tour de France Fair, not to do on it too much, is that increases the money that sponsors, one would think, would be willing to pay the teams involved in those races. If you're a women's world tour team and you're, you're – what you know, we pick a team, Trek Segafredo, like you want to go to a prospective sponsor and say, we have on our calendar this number of races broadcasted internationally – and they now have Paru Bay and Tour de France Femme, that should theoretically, the economics of cycling broken as they are for men or women, that should theoretically increase the sponsorship dollars for those teams, for all the teams involved in those races uh, rather than... So, yeah, anyway, Paru Bay Femme, exciting to see all the women finishing seem very emotional. Diagon is surprised at the finish. Uh, we saw... Movistar riders battered and bruised at the finish, crying as well. Crashes galore. I'll be keen to hear some of the uh, interviews afterwards on how riders felt and how it went for them. It's a pretty sketchy parkour right now. It might get worse for the men's race. But, yeah, any last thoughts on this, Benji? And, yeah, do you, who, do you think, uh, who do you think will win next year? Put you on the spot. How the hell would I know that now? Uh, Blanca Vash. You can't take my pick. 
can't take my pick. That's not how this works. Yeah, I knew Vash winning. It, so uh... <laughs> Vash is winning next or year. Or listen to Brand or Voss. Yeah. Like it's not like we are the all-knowing uh, people that already know the winner of next year. Uh, otherwise, we'd have a. Uh, more correct uh, predictions, but <laughs> we have correct predictions all the time, every time. Um, yeah, we Even hope you enjoyed the recap. Sorry that we went on the business of uh, cycling discussion a little bit at the end, but I feel like this is a better forum to do it. I don't really like doing it on Twitter, to be honest, with the character limitation. I like uh, addressing it in full. But let us know what you think down below. We hope you enjoyed this recap and the first edition of Parody Bay Femme. Check out my recap video on my main channel as well. Benji's got some cracking PCM videos up as well at the moment. And we'll see you with the recap of the men's race tomorrow. Ciao.